As you can see, this service today is a, a labor of love for us each year. Because we believe wholeheartedly that America is based upon a prayer. It's the only country I know of that's based upon a prayer, an ideal of justice, of liberty, of happiness for all, not just our own citizens, but for people everywhere. It's a prayer and an ideal that millions and millions of people have lived for and millions of people have died for. And so we bring the idea, the prayer of America into the sanctuary each year to celebrate that prayer and it's evolving and ever more becoming for you and for I, for our children and their children. It's an interesting question to ask ourselves, what was the first great American moment? And there are many to choose from, the Declaration of Independence included, but I go to 1782, near the end of the Revolutionary War, to where the troops of General George Washington were growing quite weary. They weren't getting enough food supplies and they weren't getting paid by Congress. This may shock you, but many people saw Congress at the time as dysfunctional. And so the troops there decided to begin a, a letter campaign. And it was all built around the idea that George Washington should be made king of America. See, this is what King George and uh, world leaders around the world thought would happen to America. They read the Declaration of Independence and they just kind of rolled their eyes and saw it as woo-woo because they believed that ultimately America would have a dictator, a king. And so it took George Washington reading these letters and gathering his troops to tell him how incredibly disappointed he was in them and to share with them that nonetheless he loved them and he would make sure that they would receive their pay. General Washington relinquished his power to that dysfunctional Congress. To me, representing one of the first great acts of our country. Arguably the second great act was two terms after serving president. General Washington would be chosen to be president of the United States and he could have easily ran for a third, fourth, ad infinitum term until his dying. But he too released that in a great act of humility. And he shared so many things in his farewell address that he had published in newspapers across the country. Uh, many warnings that we haven't heeded over the years, but one powerful piece for me is he shares, it is of infinite moment that you should properly estimate the immense value of your national union to your collective and individual happiness that you should cherish a cordial, habitual, and immovable attachment to it, accustoming yourselves to think and speak of it as of the palladium of your political safety and prosperity, watching for its preservation with jealous anxiety, discountenancing whatever may suggest even a suspicion that it can in any event be abandoned, and indignantly frowning upon the first dawning of every attempt to alienate any portion of our country from the rest, or to enfeeble the sacred ties which now link together the various parts. And George Washington is one of many who would shape the American character. Three aspects of that American character. The first, strength through humility. Washington realized that strength wasn't about assuming power it was about empowering a nation around him. You don't do this through egotism, but through great humility and belief in the people around you. A second great trait of character, freedom through responsibility. Washington understood that freedom isn't just about ensuring that I am free as an individual, but doing everything I can to ensure the long-term freedom of everyone around me as well. And lastly, what I'm calling today the spirit of resilience. 
America for me is not best defined by her moments of idealism and hope, nor by her worst moments, her moments of greatest shame and struggle. But America is best defined by her moments of resilience. When facing challenge with clarity, with self-introspection, with willingness to grow, to fight, to be resilient. That to me is one of the things that has made our American character so great throughout the years. We are a river always headed and inspired by an ocean of freedom. That is the direction we seek, the, the river of this prayer, this ideal of America to go. And the ocean is always calling us thither. Since for me, America is based on a, a prayer for freedom, it moves in alignment with all of the great religious traditions that we teach here in our church. Whether it be the Hebrews who overcome slavery in recognition of a divine call to freedom all around them. The psalm would say, there is a river whose nature streams make glad the city of God, the holy place where the most high dwells. God is within her. She will not fall. God will help her at break of day. And it goes on, I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. Freedom will be exalted in the nation, exalted in the earth. Jesus would teach that it's up to each of us to discover the truth, and then when we discover the truth, it shall set us free. The Buddha is reported to have said that just as the ocean has one taste, salt, so Buddhism only has one taste, freedom, freedom. And from our founder, Dr. Ernest Holmes, we never have to surrender anything that really belongs to life. We surrender only that which is opposed to it. Not only is that important for us as individuals to recognize that I need never surrender that which is true to life and freedom. I only need let go of that which is opposed to it, ignorant of it. Letting go of the body, but never the spirit. Letting go of the comfortable to move into greater growth. But we never have to let go of that which leads us into greater freedom and to eternal way of living. And what a great statement for our country as well, that we never have to surrender anything to do with freedom. We are only called to surrender that which is opposed to freedom. Anything that keeps that flow of the river ever calling us to that ocean of freedom, liberty, justice, and happiness. In speaking of the spirit of resilience, it's difficult not to go directly into the Civil War, the time leading up to and the, the, the time of our country since then. A war, we might argue, we never truly won and never truly fully lost. And leading up to the Civil War, there were what were called free states and slave states. And to avoid war, there was all sorts of compromise trying to keep the Union together. And one of the compromises was a, a, a revamping of what was called the, the Fugitive Slave Law that said if a person brought here from Africa, their descendants, a, a so-called slave, or to escape a slave state and move to a free state, that he or she could be arrested and returned to his or her captors. A young man by the name of Anthony Burns escaped Virginia. He was a minister. And he made his way to Boston where he became... Um, beloved. He met philosophical forefathers of ours like Ralph Waldo Emerson and Henry David Thoreau, and he would be arrested. And there was a trial, and it was decided that the law had to be followed, and he had to be brought back to Virginia. And there was martial law declared that day in the state. 
and through Boston, everyone lined up to have to watch this man, this human being who wanted nothing other than freedom, dragged in chains through the street, brought back to an uncertain future to be captive. Eventually, he would gain his freedom, but there was great outcries in the city that day and in the months and years to follow. Large rallies were held and the the American flag was hung upside down. Copies of the Constitution were burned. Henry David Thoreau spoke. He said, let the state dissolve her union with the slaveholder. Let each inhabitant of the state dissolve his union with her as long as she delays her duty. He struggled to describe a, a deep loss that he felt, and he said, I finally realize what the sense of loss is. It's the loss of my country. Ralph Waldo Emerson would later say, we must get rid of slavery, or we must get rid of freedom. This was the environment that Abraham Lincoln became president in, where he had to make the courageous, steadfast decisions not only that led to the Emancipation Proclamation, but to not allow the slave states to secede and leave the Union, leading to a great war. It's interesting to note that for most of us, we revere Lincoln today as the greatest president of all time, but during his presidency, he was seen by so many as the worst. Frederick Douglass said of Lincoln, few great public men have ever been the victims of fiercer denunciation than Abraham Lincoln was during his administration. He was often wounded in the house of his friends. Reproaches came thick and fast upon him from within and from without and from opposite quarters. He was assailed by abolitionists. He was assailed by slaveholders. He was assailed by the men who were for peace at any price. He was assailed by those who were for more prosecution of the war. He was assailed for not making the war an abolition war. He was bitterly assailed for making the war an abolition war. For a lot of us, it sounds like Fridays on Facebook. Lincoln would give his life for the war. He would give his life for his country. His wife reported on the day that he was shot that that morning he shared with her, I had a dream this morning. There was a coffin in the White House and I asked someone who was there. It is the President of the United States, they said to me. And that night, Lincoln would be murdered. As resilient and as strong as Lincoln was, his resilience does not even begin to compare to those individuals descended from Africa, brought here against their will to serve within slavery, but to never truly be slaves. And as these individuals, the African Americans, the black members of our society, that perhaps as much, if not more so, than any immigrant group have defined the spirit of resilience, have defined what it means to be an American. Lincoln, to his default in the idea of the Emancipation Proclamation, didn't know what, what the new or becoming black citizens would want. Would want. He thought that, that many of them might want to return to Africa, that they may not want to be citizens of this country. But we learned many lessons. The first, and perhaps the most interesting, is that so many black Americans decided to take on Christianity as their religion. This wasn't because their masters, so-called masters, forced it upon them. In fact, they saw things in this faith that perhaps their masters never could. They saw the story of an enslaved Hebrew people who even at their most downtrodden would sing songs of peace, of liberty, of well-being, no matter what difficulties were taking place. These songs would become the well-known spirituals that would again give birth to music as we, as we know it, gospel, country blues, whatever it is we hear on the radio now. There's a deep love of the the message of, of Jesus, the idea that any person could move through even the most terrible suffering 
and transcend their spirit through that suffering to know they are one with God, a child of God, a child of great liberty. I will spare you my own singing of a spiritual today, but I did bring a a poem inspired by spirituals by Langston Hughes, who said, I've known rivers. I've known rivers ancient as the world and older than the flow of human blood in human veins. My soul has grown deep like the rivers. I bathed in the Euphrates when dawns were young. I built my hut near the Congo and it lulled me to sleep. I looked upon the Nile and raised the pyramids above it. I heard the singing of the Mississippi when Abe Lincoln went down to New Orleans and I've seen its muddy bosom turn all golden in the sunset. I've known rivers, ancient, dusky rivers. My soul has grown deep like the rivers. For so many black Americans at the time, they also looked at the Declaration of Independence and said, this is not true legally for me, but it should be true. And so, so many black citizens in our country embodied American virtue in incredible ways. There was a gentleman by the name of Anthony Burns. And Mr. Burns had been enslaved and got his freedom. And not long after, he received a a letter famously from his former slaveholder begging him and his family to return. The old slaveholder obviously having the idea that things would be better for them if they came back home. Jordan wrote a letter that would be published all in newspapers across the country. And I just want to share a few portions of it with you. Sir, I got your letter and was glad to find that you wanted me to come back and live with you again, promising to do better for me than anybody else can. I've often felt uneasy about you. It would do me good to go back to the dear old home again and see Miss Mary and Miss Martha and Alan, Esther, Green, and Lee. Give my love to them all and tell them I hope we will meet in the better world, if not this. As to my freedom, which you say I can have, there's nothing to be gained on that score as I got my free papers back in 1864. Mandy says she would be afraid to go back without some proof that you were disposed to treat us justly and kindly. And we have concluded to test your sincerity by asking you to send us our wages for the time we served you. This will make us forget and forgive old scores and rely on your justice and friendship in the future. I served you faithfully for 32 years and Mandy 20 years. At $25 a month for me and $2 a week for Mandy, our earnings would amount to $11,680. Add this to the interest for the time our wages have been kept back and deduct what you paid for our clothing, three doctor's visits to me and pulling a tooth for Mary, and the balance will show that we are in what we are in justice entitled to. If you fail to pay us for our faithful labors in the past, we can have little faith in your promises in the future. We trust the good maker has opened your eyes to the wrongs which you and your fathers have done to me and my fathers and making us toil for you generations without recompense. In answering this letter, please state if there would be any safety for my Millie and Jane who are now grown up and both good-looking girls. You will also please state if there has been any schools open for the colored children in your neighborhood. The great desire of my life now is to give my children an education and have them form virtuous habits. Say howdy to George Carter and thank him for taking the pistol from you when you were shooting at me. From your old servant, Jordan Anderson. So many of our black citizens saw within the call of the Declaration of Independence, their own call to freedom, their own call to be citizens. In fact, after the Civil War, it was black citizens in the southern states that kept the celebration of Fourth of July going. They would have readings of the Declaration of Independence, readings of the Emancipation Proclamation, readings of the 13th Amendment, sometimes at risk of great violence. And we still see that those calls, those charges for every citizen in our country today. Nearly a hundred years later, after his baseball career, Jackie Robinson would uh, attend a a meeting of, of Negro leaders where President Dwight Eisenhower would speak and share about the race problem 
This is before the great civil rights movement of the late 50s and 1960s. And Robinson would write a letter to Dwight Eisenhower. And just to put this letter in a little bit of perspective, first of all, it's written by one of the greatest Americans of all time to another one of the greatest Americans of all time. And second, it's written from a, a private during World War II to perhaps the most accomplished general of World War II, Dwight Eisenhower. Robinson shared, I was sitting in the audience at the summit meeting of Negro leaders yesterday when you said we must have patience. On hearing you say this, I felt like standing up and saying, oh no, not again. I respectfully remind you, sir, that we have been the most patient of all people. When you said we must have self-respect, I wondered how we could have self-respect and remain patient considering the treatment accorded to us throughout the years. 17 million Negroes cannot do as you suggest and wait for the hearts of men to change. We want to enjoy now the rights that we feel are entitled to us as Americans. And for so many of us today in America, we hear these same cries for greater liberty, greater justice, not just in our laws, but in our, our systems, in our American consciousness, in our day-to-day -day interactions with one another. The river can be wet and wavy, but it is always headed towards that place of freedom. A few final points that I'd like to share with you today in light of what are difficult times for our country. The COVID crisis, a new awakening to racial injustice and a call for even greater equality for all, an uncertain economy and economic future, and what will, as usually it is, be another contentious presidential election year. The first thing I invite us all to remember, that America is at its worst when it is two sides struggling against one another, believing that the destination for either side is something different. America is at its best when we are people with many different points of view on how to get to the same destination. The answered prayer of freedom, equality, and happiness for all. I know sometimes in watching the news, we hear those who scream the loudest, those that we might say are on the, the far pole to this end or that end. Everyone deserves their voice, but remember always, no matter what your point of view, that Americans are good people. That each of us, by our very birthright and citizenship or striving toward citizenship, have that American character within us. Seek not to villainize those who disagree with you but seek to appeal to those angels of their better nature for greater understanding, greater listening, greater shared intention of what the divine destination should be for us all. I love how Supreme Court Justice Sonia Mayorior put it. She said, I felt myself more a mediator than a crusader. My strengths were reasoning, crafting compromises, finding the good and the good faith on both sides of an argument and using that to build a bridge. Always my first question was, what's the goal? And then, who must be persuaded if it is to be accomplished? And she would also say, experience has taught me that you cannot value dreams according to the odds of their coming true. Their real value is in stirring within us the will to aspire. That will, wherever it finally leads, does at least move you forward. And after a time, you may recognize that the proper measure of success is not how much you've closed the distance to some far off goal, but the quality of what you've done today. Another important thing I believe for all of us to remember, do not be on the outside looking in at your country. Do not be on the outside looking in at your country. This country is fundamentally you and me, it's the people. And no government can truly define your right to be free. No official. It's we, the people. And whether you choose to vote or not vote, your statement of action or inaction is then demonstrated. 
I know it's funny to say I'm moving to Canada, but recognize that within that as well is a denial of our prayer to realize that freedom and justice and liberty for all. So protest, criticize, do it respectfully, or even if you're, you're filled with anger, have respectful anger. But recognize that if you're not worrying, working towards that, that flow of the river, to that call of the ocean, you might be unintentionally seeking to inhibit or to stop its flow. I love how the late Senator John McCain put it not long before his death. He said, we are the heirs and caretakers of freedom, a blessing preserved with the blood of heroes down through the ages. One cannot go to Arlington Cemetery and see name upon name, grave upon grave, row upon row without being deeply moved by the sacrifice made by those young men and women. And those of us who live in this time, who are the beneficiaries of their sacrifice, must do our smaller and less dangerous part to protect what they gave everything to defend, lest we lose our own love of liberty. Love of country is another way of saying love of your fellow countrymen. A truth I learned a long time ago in a country very different from ours. Patriotism is another way of saying service to a cause greater than self-interest. If you find faults with our country, make it a better one. If you are disappointed with the mistakes of government, join its ranks and work to correct them. I hope more Americans would consider enlisting in our armed forces. I hope more would consider running for public office or working in federal, state, and local governments. But there are many public causes where your service can make our country a stronger, better one than we inherited. The good citizen and patriot knows happiness is greater than comfort, more sublime than pleasure. The cynical and indifferent know not what they miss, for their mistake is an impediment, not only to our progress as a civilization, but to their happiness as individuals. And lastly today, remember that call of the ocean of freedom for the river that is our country. Support its flow, guard it with great love and affection, and know your place in this great American story, which again is ultimately the great story of the divine and all human beings, to realize our inner divinity, to remember that you are a precious child of God, to know that by turning to within us, those sources of freedom, even when they seem totally not around us in form, by living from that light, that God imbibed light within us, we bring forth that freedom and liberty, not just for ourselves, but for everyone. To close with some words from Howard Thurman, the goal of the river is the sea. The river is ever on its way to the sea, whose far off call all waters hear. All the waters and all the earth are en route to the sea. Nothing can keep them from getting there. Men may build huge dams. There may be profound disturbances of the earth's surface that throw the river out of its course and force it to cut a new channel across a bed of granite. But at last, the river will get to the sea. It may twist and turn, fall back on itself and start again, stumble over an infinite series of hindering rocks. But at last, the river must answer the call of the sea. It is restless till it finds its rest in the sea.